Are we, I think we're getting close here, guys. Okay, yeah. All right. We are ready to rock and roll. Um, first off, thank you for coming, right? Um, everyone has uh, had a long week, has watched hundreds, if not thousands, of PowerPoint slides, and may have had adult beverages. So uh, I know this is like almost the end of the road here. We're in between you and lunch, so let's get this thing going. That's Frank. Hey, how you doing? I'm Frank, uh, product manager of Citrix. Go ahead, Patrick. All right, so if you can see, this is what we do. I'm a security nerd. I run a security consulting company called VDI Sec, where I just focus on VDI security. I break into things, I click and type things, and uh, I draw sticks and bubbles on, power, on whiteboards, so. And uh, so I come to Citrix from a background in cybersecurity, 10 years in the business, uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be part of the group and working on WAF and Netscaler and some uh, more announcements coming here too. Cool. All right, so our agenda is basically dive into the main security components within the Citrix ADC portfolio and practical things that you can do to actually <laughs> deploy these things and also get your brain wrapped around of how to plan to deploy these things. So to start off, um, just to give you guys a quick update on where Citrix is going with app security before we hand over to Patrick. Um, so the, you know, the overarching problem, as, as many of us know, is that there's uh, the, the tide of vulnerabilities and uh, ability to execute attacks on the internet is overwhelming, right? 92% of reported vulnerabilities are in apps, not in networks. Uh, and what we see is that applications, APIs, are organizations' most valuable assets. And you can see from these percentages here that there are alarmingly high percentages of organizations that uh, feel that this is an out-of-control problem for them. So what, what we're aiming to do with the app security portfolio is to continue to add additional value for uh, our customers and partners uh, to give you guys more tools to leverage. And Patrick's going to go over some of the ways you can leverage ADC today in just a few minutes. So to give you an update on uh, what we're doing with WAF and Firewall and SSL, uh, we, have a, uh, we have now a dedicated signature team. Uh, extended logging is in place as of 12.1 onwards. Uh, there's an RFC compliance check. And uh, we've also recently been ICSA certified for the MPX platform, and that actually applies to all platforms. So a lot of new stuff here on uh, WAF, uh, Firewall, and general security. And uh, we're also uh, making headway on content inspection. So ICAP, the uh, process of sending um, traffic over to an IPS or uh, uh, IDA, for example, to inspect it for vulnerabilities or for violating traffic is there. Um, inline device integration and port mirroring as well. So these are all things that are there right now today. What we're also excited to announce is, uh, this, this was in the keynote, but maybe you guys may have missed it, uh, we're also excited to announce that we're developing a bot management platform as part of the Citrix ADC. Uh, so bots basically means anything that's automated or scripted, right? And it can be a, a kid in his dorm with a Python, Python script, or it can be a, a nation state sophisticated attack, right? It's a very wide range of capabilities as in, and sophistication. Uh, and what the bot management platform aims to do is to control unwanted automated traffic to your website. So features, uh, device fingerprinting, uh, over 2,600 signatures, uh, as well as uh, rate-based and behavior-based detection. So this is coming out in Q3. Oh, and there's a little swirly animation, just to drive that point home. So with that, I'll hand it over to Patrick, because uh, I, I think it's more valuable for you guys to hear from a road warrior who's done this for many years on how to implement best uh, security practices in ADC. Cool. Thanks, Frank. All right. So uh, back in 2006, I thought Netscalers were cool. And I don't know how many times I'm going to say Netscaler. It could be another drinking game for Synergy right now. <laughs> um, hopefully, you just have water to rehydrate for your drive and fly home. Um, but once I got in past the gateway, I realized there was so much more it could do. It was the Swiss Army knife of being able to secure things and make things more highly available. And of course, MacGyver would have one, right? If he has a Swiss Army knife, that is his network Swiss Army knife. <laughs> so first thing is, do you have an ADC? Yes. Let's get ready to rumble. If you don't, sad panda, right? Uh, it's a very powerful appliance, and if you don't have one and you have a Citrix deployment, you're definitely missing out on a lot of features, uh, and especially when it comes to security and availability. 
But if you do have one, it's what version do you have, right? So obviously we have standard, advanced, and premium, which used to be platinum, so we like to change names to keep it exciting for all of us. But platinum, you get all the goodies, right? And then something in between. Most people, even standard edition, you have denial service protection, you should use it, right? And we'll kind of go into that. So let's eliminate these threats together and be happy about it, right? Because it's gonna be super fun, right? So first thing, of the three amigos of protection, the kind of the core foundation of Netscaler security is GeoIP. If I can eliminate a couple billion IP addresses with just a single checkbox, that's exactly reducing my attack surface by anywhere from 40 to 60%. Now, if you have people that are jet setters that are going all over the world, you're gonna have to include other companies and it could get kind of annoying, right? Because it's a gigantic CSV file and you have to define IP ranges and IP ranges are sold and bought and traded and they become this country, then that country but it's at least you're trying to do something, right? A lot of things in security are not absolute. All we're trying to do is reduce risk, right? So if we can reduce risk by doing this and that, we'll do it, right? So from there, this is kind of the process. So if you screenshot this or even go to that CTX article, that is how you turn on GOIP blocking exactly. It is not a complicated process, it is five steps. And basically once you've imported it, it is assigning it to a VIP. Most important thing to note on this overarching, everything, every VIP that we're talking about and all the cool things we wanna turn on, I want you to go back to your home and I want you to right click your gateway, I want you to right click your storefront VIP, I want you to right click something, I want you to copy it. I don't want you to do this to production, I want you to make a new IP address that has these things turned on and guess what, test it, right? No one's gonna know about this new VIP except you. So when we kind of go through this, this is basically what it looks like from the command line where you can see how many records there are for that CSV. And we kind of step through this and we are entering these commands. We're making a responder policy. We can see what we want to name it. We're dropping by country or we're dropping there. A lot of this stuff is up to you. And label policies something that makes sense. Don't just say GOIP uh, because most likely it's going to be GOIP hyphen not this country, not that country, not that country, right? Or just US. And then once you've actually made that responder policy, you can go to policy manager and you can bind it to your top secret IIS server. And then if it doesn't work, guess what? You can unbind it, right? These are not absolute things. This is an easy way for you to roll it out very safely and provide a lot of protection to your company. And then you just hit bind and bada bing. Now if it comes from those IP ranges, it's not allowed to come to your site. What that allows too is it saves you a lot of bandwidth internally, processing requests, a lot of CPU and RAM that's wasted doing bad requests for other deployments. So that's good. So obviously GOIP databases, March 2018, uh, is how, that's how big it was there and it's continually growing and shifting. If you really go down this road, you're probably gonna wanna get one of these subscriptions and that way it's more up to date automatically-ish right? Uh, just like most things. And this is what it looks like, right? Um, it shows you which country, which IP start, range, and uh, then basically a sequential number. And then you can't talk about GeoIP without bad IPs because there's IPs all over the world and there's bad IPs everywhere else around that. And you can't have that without a bad reputation uh, from Tay Tay, right? We got to respect her. Um, so, you know, she does have a bad reputation, a big reputation, right? So basically what this does is this is just, we've already eliminated a couple billion IP addresses. Now we're going to eliminate a couple hundred million IP addresses. These are IP addresses that are on bot networks, anonymizers, Tor exit nodes, things that maybe you don't want bi your business users to be coming through on. So it's a good way to block. And it's kind of, it comes in from WebRoot and basically it looks through that XML file and says, hey, you're shady, you're not allowed to connect, right? And so when we do this, this is yet another very simple thing, uh, but you need to make sure your Netscaler can get to the internets. So depending on if you've done a very good job firewalling your NSIPs, you're gonna need to open up some stuff, right? Um, and don't open up the internet, just open it up to very specific uh, DNS names, right? Which could get annoying in some cases, but it's a lot safer than just saying your Netscaler should get to the internet. Kind of the same thing, this is a very simple process. You turn on reputation, you 
click a box, like this is literally how easy this is, and then we hit OK, and then we go back to that responder policy that we just made for GOIP, and we make one for bad IP, and we do the exact same thing, and we're going to say is malicious. We can also do many other filters, as you can see, so that we can just block certain types of sites that are malicious. You don't have to go all in and block all of them. Um, you might not want that many in there. So then now we've got GOIP blocking and now we have um, bad IP blocking. And basically you can look here and you can see if you can get to it or not get to it, right? There's a couple command lines. The CTX article at the very beginning of this can actually talk about that. So now we've eliminated billions of IP addresses from talking to us, a couple hundred million more IP addresses to talk to us. And now what we want to do is fine tune that with quality of service. We want to make sure that we know how big things are and how fast things can go. And there have been gigantic multi-terabit attacks of denial of service. And terabit, denial of service attacks are also a great way to knock the door down and you're dealing with the denial of service while there's a persistent attacker. Sometimes these things are very coordinated. Uh, they're not by random, they're not by accident. When someone wants to spend a bunch of money to denial of service attack you, it's usually for a good reason um, for them. So, Let's think about how we need to put our brains around how to turn on AppQOE and the denial of service protection. Our internet circuit is one gigabit. Our ADC uplink is 10 gigabit. Our external VIP DOS limit, what should it be? Maybe 0.75 gigs, maybe less than that. If your internet is only 100 megs, your VIP should not be set to 10 gigs. Where does that make sense, right? So let's go ahead and turn those down. And guess what? All of you, if you have a Citrix ADC, can do this. This isn't a platinum feature. This is a very simple way to do it. And if we have internal websites, it's kind of the same thing. Even though that user might have a gigabit or maybe 480 bit or 480 megabits because they're on 802.11, right? They're on Wi-Fi. Maybe it needs to be even lower than that. Maybe it just needs to be 100 megabits. This is where if you don't have Moss installed, it's gonna be kind of hard for you to do some of this. These are kind of, this is the cheat sheet. You need to think about how, what's the average number of users, especially we're talking about gateway, right? So we can limit things based on that. Um, but then how many responses per second? This is where Moss comes in, where you're gonna be able to look at your existing VIP and go, hey, I get about seven million packets per second. Okay, maybe I'll make it 10 million. Because if it was 20 million, something really bad is going on, right? We just doubled our company size overnight. Someone is actually attacking us, right? Then from there, what's our throughput? What's our big throughput limits? So this is where you're gonna look in Moss or even on the Netscaler analy analysis chapter and reporting, you'll be able to see that. And that maximum amount of bandwidth and the number of clients. So you can also limit things by the number of connections. So if you know you only have 33,000 connections, don't allow 2.7 million, right? Uh, there's many default values, especially when it comes to the Netscaler. Netscaler is made for performance, so a lot of these counters are all at zero. Maximum throttle, Scotty, right? Like, we're going warp seven. Like, let's do this. Hey, so, Patrick, sorry, before you go on, can you explain briefly for people in the audience who don't know what MASS is or ADM? Yep, yep, so Netscaler MOSS, if you don't know that, that's their management analytics services, and basically it is a sweet way to be able to visualize what's going on in your Netscaler. One thing, a, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words and a graph is worth a thousand too, right? So when you see gigantic peaks and valleys, you can see real usage. And it's also a great way to co correlate all your syslogs. It's also a great way to back up all your Netscalers and get configurations and be able to restore it. So if you have more than one Netscaler and you have an HA pair, you should have MOS deployed. Uh, and it's and been renamed ADM, right? ADM, yeah. 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 So Net Netscaler. Everyone's too. still getting used to the it, names. It, <laughs> it happens. Yeah, no worries. So basically, this is the picture. If ever, I think everyone already saw snapshots, but basically this is the process. You literally come in here and you can see those are the things you need to know before you start doing this. Make them really big and then start tra turning them down, right? Make them safe. You don't want to cause an outage, and this is why we're also doing this on a test VIP. We're not doing it on the production VIP. And guess what's cool about this? We, all we're doing so far is we're making three responder policies. And when we're done, we go to production and we just apply one, let it marinate for a week, apply two, let it marinate for a week, apply the third one, let it marinate for a week. We've eliminated over 3 billion IP addresses, 100 million bad IP addresses, and we've eliminated the possibility that someone can actually crash the Netscaler or, or that backend website in just three responder policies. This is not high-tech, super you know, hacker matrix stuff here. 
Now, testing a denial service. Um, this can get kind of shady. If you're going to do this, these all work. Uh, this is what I use to test denial service protection policies. Run it in a VM, run it sandboxed. Be careful where you put it on your network. This is very old software. It's shady, so treat it shady, right? Um, but it's the only way you're going to make it tilt, right? There's other, there's other applications out there that can do it. Um, there's ways you can custom write some PowerShell scripts, but these work like no problem. Um, but you need to protect yourself. So danger Will Robinson. Dropping in valid packets. This is also another great way. These are just a couple commands that drop, can drop literally billions of IP uh, packets a day from your appliance. It means it doesn't have to process them anymore. It doesn't have to figure out like, hey, where's this go? That goes to this VIP, that goes to this VIP. Drop things that are not right. If someone's sending you a malformed packet, it's for a reason, right? They're attempting to exploit you. They're attempting to turn the doorknob of your access gateway, your OWA site, your whatever, right? So you can block those. And then strict transport protocol. Someone's giving you some bogus HTTPS traffic, we don't want that either. It's part of invalid packets, but we wanna make sure we're processing things in a safe manner. And as we keep going through this, we're eliminating threats, every single one of these responder policies and every time we hit enter on here. Um, as you can see, some of these, um, the way you apply them is the same way. It's just a checkbox on a VIP. This is not something that takes days, weeks, months to do do it on a test FIP, right? Don't go, don't go running with scissors. And you can actually see too, what's the maximum age? And if you can see that, that's like basically forever is what that it means in Netscaler. So it means it trusts it forever. So you can adjust that. And if you see here, this is where you should also be looking underneath protocol. This is where you need to be paying attention to your SSL, right? TLS 1.0, I wouldn't think so. 1.1, maybe 1.2, because you have to. 1.3, you want to be ready, right? Um, so depending on where you're at in your Citrix receiver life and workspace app is how far you can go with that. Send cookies are another great way to attack people. Um, but the good thing, the Netscaler has a built-in protection policy, and it just blocks them right off the bat. You guys can read that. Cookie Monster is not happy with the Netscaler, right? So it's. It's what it is. So if you look at it, it's just more stuff on how a SIN DOS works versus a regular denial service. And so probably the literally the most powerful security feature that Citrix has when it comes to the ADC appliance is the Waffinator, right? The Citrix web application firewall. And so if you're not a network person or security person, you usually don't get to pick the applications. The applications pick us, right? We don't cook it, we just serve it. And so when that happens, we need web application firewall. And it's because it goes beyond just opening up port 80 and 443. Like all the firewall guy and the NAT is done, but that means anything is literally allowed at port 80 and 443, right? So we want to eliminate that. And so anything that's high value, most likely if it's behind your ADC, it is high value. Most likely if it's published in Citrix, it's high value. It's business critical, it's revenue impacting, right? So almost everything could be determined for that. So we eliminate those, but the key is, is remember, is if we're just allowing those ports open, it only takes one security defect from any of your application portfolio to cause someone to be able to get in, right? And so this is where WAF really starts to shine. And this is like a more visual, visual way to look at it. Your, app, your regular firewall is only blocking just three layers of that model. And so you no know restrictions are happening on what types of packets and protocols that can come across there. Malformed packets, bad things, payloads, byte sizes, how big the packets are, MTUs, it's just all unlimited. So when we put a ADC WAF in front of it, then we are expecting those things and we are the man in the middle so we can apply much more granular policies than that firewall can. And you paid good money for your ADC, so you, you definitely want to use that. So they're on their seventh generation of firewall. So depending, if you, over 200 gigabits of throughput, so there's literally no reason for any of us mere mortals other than maybe Google or Apple that need like 72 of these because they're doing like a couple terabits a second. There is an app firewall appliance that's going to be able to support your traffic, right? So that's the good thing. And uh, when we get to here, this is kind of how it works. This is like an AV at this point. It has negative mode. I know what bad things are, and I'm going to block bad things. It's cross-site scripting, certain types of strict and slow and fast attacks and send attacks. 
and then positive. We put the thing in learning mode, right? So it's gonna learn what good traffic is. This is where most people make mistakes. They don't give it all the traffic it needs. Someone did not go through the whole workflow of that application. Say if it's a patient application where all we're doing is uploading insurance cards, we need the whole card to get uploaded. We need multiple times of people going through that application to see the good behavior. So that Netscaler knows that if someone sends me a XML file and it's 1024K, that's good. So anything bigger than that is no, right? So when we combine those two, we get into hybrid, where we're blocking the bad things, and we're also, we only allow the good things. What this does is it's zero day protection. It means that when something bad is attempted, it's completely dropped. And if we've listened and we're kind of picking up what we're doing, we've eliminated so many threats until this slide. Billions of IP addresses can't even talk to this WAF appliance. Right? Hundreds of millions of bad IP addresses can't do it. Millions and millions of requests that are not correct can't talk to it. And now once it's here, we're the gatekeepers. So that is the, the good way and most important right there. One does not tur simply turn this on without testing. One thing that's all, when you go down this WAF road, it is a journey and it's gonna be a lifelong partner. So, you know, respect it accordingly, right? Buy an anniversary gifts because one thing that's gonna happen is you patch this system, this application that's behind there, you may have to go back into learning mode because the application literally changed. They changed their packet sizes, they changed their rates, they changed the way they talk, they changed the ports. So you're gonna need to constantly test this. So you need to have a test WAF VIP in front of your test application. And hopefully you have a test application. We're not just testing in prod, you know, with scissors running around that with, with a fire, right? So hopefully not. But WAF is just as easy to implement. Basically, we turn it on, phase one, um, and we clone that VIP, and then we run the wizard and we keep testing it. And so as we keep going through this policy, those are the things that it's allowing us to do. The good thing about WAF, if you turn on logging, it doesn't block anything. And that way you can look through the logs and see what would have been blocked if you've been to my session about application whitelisting and stuff like that, you wanna turn on auditing mode first. You wanna know what it would have blocked. You don't wanna just turn this on and hope for the best, right? Living on a prayer is a song, not a way to live when you talk about this, right? So you can see these are all types of different types of known bad attacks, and you basically check the box. Multi-factor authentication. Um, this is probably the best illustration I can show you and the, how important it is. When I do penetration tests and break into people's offices, uh, externally, internally, in every which way, I only need a username and password if you just give me with no MFA. I literally just need one piece of information. And there's over six billion records on dhash.com and have I been pwned that are easily searchable. So with that, if you just have MFA, maybe not the best MFA, right? Because there's obviously varying levels. You need at least three to five things stolen, acquired from your target before you can attack. Now, is this a completely infallible? No, nothing in security is infallible. It just takes pressure and time. It only takes usually about two minutes for me to go past most MFA's deployments, and it's just social engineering. It just takes a couple minute phone call to talk to someone and say, hey, how's it going today? I see Frank's out. Have you been having problems with your token? No, my token's good. Well, Frank told me I needed to call and he was really worried that you can't get in. Oh, okay. Well, can, can you help me out and just tell me what your token is real quick? Yeah, yeah, it's 642 633 okay, perfect, thank you, have a great day. I'll let Frank know when he comes back from vacation. Done, just logged in, MFA defeated, right? Why is that? Well, because the person on social media posted exactly where they were. It was all updated and correlated with LinkedIn. So I can see the organization. I know who works there. I know who's in the same department. And within just that little piece of social information, I was able to exploit that. And so if you're not doing good social engineering and phishing training, this is the same thing that will happen to you. There's been many attacks where MFA has been done by that. So the way I like to do MFA is the opposite of most everyone that ever does MFA, especially if you call Duo or Azure and you say, hey, I'd like some MFA, they say, just give it to all the users. That is the exact opposite of what you wanna do. First, you wanna start with IT. You guys need to be comfortable with it. You need to know what it does. You need to know how it works. 
Next, we need to go to the CEOs. I know we don't like them, they don't like computers, but we have to do it. We want to go from the top down, right? We don't want to go from the bottom up. We want them to be there. Who can transfer $800,000 on a Tuesday and it doesn't look anything out of the normal? The C-suite, the people in finance, people in purchasing. Also, don't forget their assistants and their secretaries. They can send millions and millions of dollars with just a single email, and that happens all the time. Um, if anyone paid attention to some fake POs that went down for Google and Facebook, over $100 million was transferred to the incorrect company because of an email. That's all it takes, right? And then we're gonna go down to leadership. We want VPs, directors, we want everybody, all the way down to team leads. Because if you're gonna roll out some new technology, you want someone that can help be your champion right? And they need to understand the importance to it. You can also just show the Google and Facebook story. We don't want to lose $100 million on a Tuesday because someone sent a bad email, right? We're trying to defend ourselves. And then once you have done that top down, then it's time to get the rest. We don't need to boil the ocean. We want to do it at a gradual pace, make sure everyone's familiar with it because it is an annoying process. If you work in the healthcare industry and people are in and out of systems all the time, or even banking and tellers, you're probably gonna need to invest in some proximity cards. That means at least I have to have two or three things to log into somebody, even with that prox card. It's not as vast as MFA, but it's at least something. Um, and if we're talking about MFA, I don't recommend any SMS-based systems if you can help it, because there is a thing called SIM swapping, which means I can become your SIM number, and then I'm getting the text with the four-digit code to log in as you, right? So it just eliminates a lot of other things. So. You gotta go in there. So if you don't have it enabled, definitely take a look at it. There's lots of good partners. Um, I've seen kind of everywhere. And even think about one-time passwords and other things. Those are also great ways to prevent bots from attacking, right? And many other ways to add just one more layer of authentication. And some of these are completely free. We don't need to spend hundreds or millions of dollars to do this. So ADC IP is kind of foundational. Make sure they're actually on a network that's secure. Right? Make sure you're using HTTPS every single time you log into it. And make sure you replace that default certificate. Every single time you're doing your day-to-day -day IT life and you hit accept, don't worry about it, advanced, accept, ex allow exception, you just allowed a man in the middle. That's what you just did. I can be in there, Wi-Fi pineapple, and you logged into vCenter, you logged into your Citrix ADC, I just got the clear text password, right? And that's what happens very often. So you need to replace these default certificates so that when that bar turns red, you run to the hills because something is wrong. Someone is in the middle of your connection. You're never gonna know it because you keep hitting accept, 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 accept every single day. Probably 10 and 20 times a day, you've got a red bar and you've done all types of work and hopefully no one's in the middle, right? So make sure you bind it to LDAP. Still so many places don't use LDAP and they're still using NS root. What does that mean? No one has any accountability. When something bad happens, who broke it? I don't know, NS root did. Well, who knows NS root? All 72 people. Oh, cool. All right, well, who wants to raise their hand? No one's gonna raise their hand. All right, well, we'll just move on, right? It was just an outage, we just lost a couple million dollars, no big deal. Um, so make sure you're binding it to Active Directory and then change that default password. People that are on SDXs are the worst offenders of this because they made their one golden template and they make like three or four instances for this application and that application and they have the same password. NS root, NS root. I've been at pl places that made billions of dollars and they had NS root, NS root on a very production, very dangerous VPX instance on an SDX, right? So change those passwords and then make sure you're logging who here even logs their syslog on their Netscalers? Ah, this is a good crowd. I like you guys. Usually it's like one person and then one person that doesn't want to raise their hand because some hacker dude's talking about it, right? So you don't want to do that. It's kind of awkward. Um, but you want to do this. If you don't log, you're never going to find out. You're never going to be able to do incident responses. I've been at incident responses that they said, oh, we just got breached. We come in, we look at it, and we find out that the logs had just rolled off a week ago because they have so much traffic. AAA debug, completely full, right? So get logs, there's free ways to do that. Um, there's Elk and many other things. Obviously there's paid solutions, but hopefully that does it. 
So we're kind of at the final countdown here. Um, we went a little bit faster, um, which is good. And you know, this is the final countdown, all right? So final thoughts. Just like we've talked about layered security, defense in depth, start with GOIP, then go to bad IP, then go to app QOE, then go to strict protocols, right? HSTS, work your way down. You're eliminating threats every single checkbox. You're eliminating threats every single policy. We're doing it on a test VIP. We make sure it works. We promote that VIP into production and we do it, right? And if you can use WAF, use it but make sure you understand the relationship you're getting yourself into, right, as updates happen. Um, I've seen lots of people have updates over the weekend and the whole site goes down and that's because learning mode is blocking stuff because it's never seen it before, right? It's very, very common. And then make sure you're using MFA. Pretty, pretty, pretty please, right? Um, do, do everywhere you can. Now, even if it just has to be admin, I know a lot of places, uh, especially state, local, federal government and nonprofits and stuff like that, we can't afford to get all 75,000 users access to MFA. At least do IT. At least do the C-suite. At least do anyone, anyone that can move millions of dollars of money, right? Let's, let's assess our users and apply the appropriate controls for them. Replace those default certificates. Don't allow exceptions anymore, right? There is guides after guides after guides of how to replace a default certificate for everything that has a certificate. So use those. It can be annoying. What I suggest is make sure it's a three to five year so you don't have to do it that long. Put it on your calendar. Say one month before, replace the certificate, right? Now, maybe you're not there in five years, but you know, you tried, right? So there's lots of features, there's lots of things it's adding. And so, you know, the most important thing for us is make sure if you like kind of this technical deep dive, there's a lot more deeper we could go. This was the high level of all the major features. Um, and we didn't really even get into some of the access control and analytics and all the other things that go on. Um, so if you like this kind of session, make sure you do your survey, tweet out. And if there's any questions, we've got plenty of time. And if you are not from America and you've never had a Goo Goo cluster, there's a pile of them up here. They can change your life. Um, and they're chocolate coated and marshmallow goodness with some caramel or pecans. Um, they're amazing. And if you like stickers, I have two sizes. Uh, if you like me a little bit, there's little stickers. And if you like me a lot, there's big stickers, right? <laughs> so depending on whichever way. Frank, do you got anything else? No, I think uh, if anyone has any questions, come see us here after the session. Uh, yep. And if y'all are here and you're still going to keep your Netscaler brain turned on, these are the mm -hmm. remaining ADC uh, presentations that you guys can go to. And you know. Come visit the booths, too, if you haven't already. A lot of great uh, demonstrations of Citrix technology down there. Yeah, and I'm definitely excited about a lot of the bot network stuff. If you're not familiar and you know part of that bad IP, the bot network really dovetails into that. And so when that feature comes, that's just gonna be more protection. So it's gonna eliminate millions and millions of IP addresses from being able to talk to you also. So if y'all have any other questions, let us know. We'll be up here and uh, y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.